Hmm, nice. I like the music. Oh, good. Hey. good morning. Hey, um, welcome everybody. Welcome to this talk. Um, it's one that my uh, some of my colleagues actually have been looking forward to because it's a topic that is uh, interesting to a lot of us. Maybe not so much to the hardcore developers, but to everybody else, it's certainly pretty relevant and nobody is perfect, I can tell you that. Um, I'm welcoming on stage here uh, Mr. Dwayne McDaniel. I think it's a well-known name in the Git world and also in the Drupal world. Uh, for those who don't know you yet, I guess you will have a little intro. Is that right? I got an intro um, on, the, on the presentation. Yeah, one thing that I should mention is that uh, for you, it's early morning. You're coming to us from Chicago, Illinois. Yep, uh, that's so correct. that makes it 8 a.m., is that right? Yeah, that's correct. It's 8 a.m. here. Okay, sounds like three cups of coffee. <laughs> well, I'm still on my first cup, but I'll, I'll, I'll be having more. <laughs> okay, the good news is that uh, Dwayne was cheating a little bit. He sent us a pre-recorded talk, <laughs> so he, he can do all the coffee he needs. And then he will be back for your answers. If you have any questions, um, please use the Q&A tab, not the chat, but the Q&A, because that is specific to this talk and everybody else can see the questions as well. So uh, yeah, drop all the questions you have there and we'll answer it after the pre-recorded uh, talk in a live fashion. So that's it. Dwayne, did I forget anything important? I think that's it. So uh, get into it. Okay, once again, thanks for being here. And I hit the play button and uh, we'll see how that goes. Conference Global 2022. Welcome to my talk, Git, the other database you need to know. Very glad to be here with you all today. I'm Dwayne. I work for a company called Git Kraken. More about them in a second. I live in Chicago, Illinois. I'm a developer evangelist. Outside of tech, I love karaoke, live music, improv, and knitting and crochet. So if you ever want to hit me up about any of those things, there's my Twitter handle. That's the best way to get a hold of me. So I work for Git Kraken. We make legendary Git tools. So I spend a lot of my time thinking about Git. Uh, we make Git Kraken Client, uh, a desktop app that I'll talk about actually a little bit later in this talk that helps manage Git maybe a little bit easier and safer than doing it through the command line alone. Git wins for VS Code. If you're using VS Code, this is free open source and it's awesome. It exposes authorship at every line of code and unleashes a whole suite of powers inside of the world's favorite code editor. And Git integration for Jira does just what it says on the box. If you're using Jira and Git, this tool helps you use them together better. Devs love it because they don't have to interrupt their workflow to update Jira and managers love it because Jira gets updated. So, what is a talk about Git doing here at a Modic conference? Modic lives in this very interesting space. It's a very technical open source project that if you ever have gotten up and running on your own, you know, it's like there's a lot of code there. <laughs> there's a lot of things to consider. But the end user is the marketer, uh, someone who's used to working primarily with GUI interfaces, drag and drop, and just going through uh, web interfaces. And I think there's a bit of a, a gap that's happening there, at least in my experience. I work in marketing uh, as a developer evangelist, and I am one of the more technical people on my team. There's other folks that would like to become more technical, and they are becoming more technical, and they're learning those skills. But uh, working with them, I'm learning that you know, there's just some concepts that if you have, go to a talk like this and you understand like what Git's actually doing and its role in the whole ecosystem, it does help us get to that other side. Not that one side is the other is better. I live pretty much right in the middle there myself. So what I'm going to do today is go through a quick high-level overview of the history of Git, conceptually what it's doing, then we'll walk through the actual steps of getting started. This is a time if you're... Uh, watching this and you've never installed Git, play along at home. Uh, this is something that anybody can do. And I highly encourage you to just embrace it and get your hands dirty. And that's really the only way you're going to learn. Um, you can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a seminar. I can't teach you the ins and outs of Git and have it stick. And you can't walk out of the session a Git expert. The only way to do that is to start using it. So I encourage you to do so. 
And you might be wondering, why did I call this the other database you need to know? Well, from a particular worldview, and the worldview I hold, most all web applications are just a way to get to a database. The database, in my opinion, is the most critical piece of the setup. I can abstract almost everything else to the browser at this point. The browser is one of the most powerful engines we've ever built as human beings. But that database layer still needs to be there. We still need somewhere for our stuff to come from and for us to put our stuff. It's the linchpin that makes web apps possible. Git is very much the same role, though it's very low in the stack and we don't think about it outside of maybe code. It is literally the engine that helps us move that code around and enables modern CI CD, lets us build our pipelines, lets us safely evolve our code. Um, it's a real superpower, but it's that linchpin underneath whatever else you're doing, at least in my opinion. So that's why I call it the other database you need to know. Git is free and open source distributed version control system. It's a version control system. So you make a change to a, a document, you write down what you changed, and then you make a permanent record of that. And then you change the document again and you make a record of that. So you're controlling the versions of whatever you're working on. It was written originally by this guy, Linus Torvald. You might've heard of him. He's the guy that started the Linux project. He wrote Git to help him with specifically his job of maintaining all of these patches that people were submitting to the Linux kernel. Quickly, he's like, well, I don't want to maintain this thing. And it's got a lot of potential. So Junio uh, Gitster took it over and he's been maintaining it ever since. So they actually called it the stupid content tracker. When you work with Git long enough, you do start calling it like stupid and <laughs> saying things like dang it, Git a lot. Well, dang it, Git will come up at the end too. But this was the problem they actually were solving. What version is the final version? Which patch should I apply if I have a, a file full of patches that all are some variation of the same thing? Which is final? It's a problem we all faced at some point in our life. If you use a central distribution model and you have two developers that push code a minute apart, in this scenario, blue wins. Blue will overwrite yellow's changes. And those were the problems that Git was built to solve. And that's what it does. And it does this by taking individual snapshots of your directory, your file system, every single time you make a commit. That's the individual unit of work is a commit. And it will take a small compressed version, very compressed version of those files <clears throat> and store them in a chain. It will stack them together. We can look at it as a graph and we can even jump back and forth between all of these dots. All these dots are commits and I can go and get at any of them anytime I want. Git also gives us this awesome ability to create parallel universes where we can work safely in things called branches and we can always jump back and forth between any of these spots and a graph and even merge together points in that graph and rewrite history with things called rebase, but we're not gonna get into rebase today. So Git also is a transport mechanism. It also lets us easily share those snapshots between computers. That's literally the basis for how GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, all these people do their work. Now these services build an entire layer of services on top of it, CI CD tools, we'll get to more of that later, but that core functionality is Git. It's all based on Git. You do not need to sign up for any of these services to use Git. Git, you can run it completely locally and never actually push your code online anywhere or push it completely to a private server somewhere that you just set up. You don't need any of these tools to use Git, but you need Git to use any of these tools. So it's distributed. This is a couple of weird concepts with it. One, there's no official version of the repo with Git. Every version of the repo thinks it's the official version of the repo. And everything is local to Git always. 
That's a picture from Oakland, California down there. Gertrude Stein once said, the problem with Oakland is that there's no there there. So artists some time ago put a there in Oakland. And no matter where you are in relative to here or there or where you're sitting at home, you are there to you or you're here from your point of reference. That's how Git works. That's a little confusing, I know. Always, always, always step back when you're confused about you know, what's going on with Git and think, all right, what is the point of view of Git? Oh, it's local to that particular checkout, that particular reference point. So that's the concepts of Git. I know there's a lot there and it went pretty quick, but let's talk quickly about getting this set up. And I do have a practical example at the end where we'll walk through a pretty standard use case. So to get it set up, we actually need the program Git. This is if you're using the command line. If you're using the command line tool Git, you need to install it. Some tools like Git Crack and Client don't require you to install Git. It, well, I'll talk about how it accomplishes it Git a little bit later, but you probably should install Git on your machine. If you're using Linux, it's probably already there. Uh, you need to actually tell Git who you are, set some configs, a settings, a really straightforward, only three lines that we're going to bother with today. And then we need to initialize or actually make a Git project. And that's super easy. And most of the time, someone already did that for you. So to get Git, you go to git-sem.com, the official website for the Git project. There you can download it for any version of pretty much any operating system in the world and get it set up. Uh, it takes you a couple minutes at tops. Then you need to tell Git some specific information. You tell it who you are, your name and email address. This is the, the standard convention for how we identify who made a commit is name and email address. That last one, i um, not going to dig into it too deeply, but in the past, Git's default initial branch was called master. And let's just call it main. We've all agreed main's a better name. So we need to run this locally just to make sure that the first time you set up a Git instance main is the name, but that's all we'll have to say about that for now. Um, and what does that do? What do those commands do? Cause I've jumped, we've dropped immediately into doing commands. All that does is writes to your dot config file. This lives on your, in your home directory. And this is what it looks like. You can actually go edit this by hand. If you prefer than using the command line, I'm grayed out my signing key, but there's a lot more in my Git configs. There's hundreds of things you can configure with Git, but to get started, just know your name and email address and probably just call that main branch main. After that, you're ready to go and you're ready to start making a project. So to make that .git folder I mentioned earlier, you run git init and git init builds a git folder and then tells git, hey, pay attention. Something's happening in this folder and now we're gonna track what's going on. There's a lot in here, but the big takeaway here is look at these file sizes. We're talking bytes. That's how efficient Git is. It was written with efficiency and speed in mind. So like there's the things like head, which, you know, there's some funny sounding words in here. Head 31 bytes long is a super important file that just tells you where Git is. That's the here for Git. So there's my main branch. So branching is just a pointer. It's a pointer that human readable says, here's a commit that happened. Here's what we called it as human beings and Git thinks we're here. That's the basis of how Git works. Most of the time though, you're not going to build that Git folder yourself. Someone's already done that for you when they started the project. So if you clone down uh, the Modic project, for instance, it comes with a Git folder because it's a Git project. <laughs> Uh, clone is another command that says copy the files locally, but remember where I came from. Remember to keep an eye on that place where I came from. And if there's changes there, alert me and say how many steps I am ahead or behind. Most of the time, this is really the only two commands you're, you're going to use. Like 90% of Git workflow is this. You do your work, you get add to add your saved work to a staging area, a special uh, area. Uh, it's actually the index. If you look back in that Git folder, there's a file called index. That's your staging area. So it adds it to that, get it, gets it ready to commit. And then you do a get commit and it actually does the compression, the hashing, and gets one of those really long numbers, those commit chas, they call them. 
and then you go about your work. You make change to the documents, you get add them when you're ready to do your work, get commit gives you a chance as an author to explain yourself, explain what was in that commit and why you did it. And then you make that commit. I know I'm going quick, quick here, but there's a practical example in the end. We'll tie it all back together. At any point, you can always look back at that chain of commits. That's your history is called git log. And that's actually the command, <laughs> the git log. And it will tell you who made the commit. There's that hash number I was talking about. That's the, the checksum for the compressed version of the file system when John here made this on May uh, 23rd at that exact time. Uh, get, that's what Git at the heart is helping us do this. Here's the version of the file that we're referencing. Here's who did it. Here's when they did it. And there's the message that John wrote us. He bumped to three, 4.31. Somebody earlier sanitized the account. All right. Git itself will always tell you what state it's in. Between those git add, git commit, it will see if something's untracked, if there's a file there that it doesn't know about, or it doesn't know that you're supposed to track, but it knows it's there. It will say, hey, I'm tracking these files, uh, like readme and the composers. They've changed, but you haven't committed them, or they're not staged at all, or they're staged, but they haven't been committed. It will get... Uh, status will tell you this. This is a read-only operation. Run this often. This is one of your best friends in Git. Git log and Git status are two amazing best friends in the in the Git world. Then we get to one of the real superpowers of Git is Git checkout. Checkout moves head. It moves the point of reference of Git. So at any point you can say Git checkout and any of the commit shahs. Uh, the, these are the short commit hashes, but at any point you can move the head to any of those files. And what that does, it actually transforms the file system back into the state it was in when that commit was made. It can show you the difference between those if you run a git diff, but it can also like just really go back in time. So if you know you did something back here, but you changed it here and you couldn't remember exactly what you did, but you want to get that back, just check it back out. Go copy those files. When you're ready to go back and do your work normally, go check out main and you're back at it. I keep talking about main as a branch. And this is one of the parts that's hard to wrap your head around when you first encounter it, in my opinion. Git branching works one way and we explain it slightly different. Conceptually, this is easier to understand on a graph. So we can do our work separately in different branches, these swim lanes of a very topic and concern. Meanwhile, we can keep making like hot fixes and this would be like C8 and C9 and C10. And at any point we can say, all right, I need C5 to merge back into master and be deployed. I should have updated this to main, but this is right out of the Git book, the pro Git book. Well, I'll link to that at the end. But what really is happening is this. We're just adding additional tags, human readable tags that point to specific commits. Every commit points back to where it came from, its parent. If I wanted to check out testing, I could do a git checkout testing. That's what I would run. And it would point head at testing. And now that would be the point of reference. That would be reality for my file system. And then again, when I'm ready to go back to main, I'll just check out main. I can merge any of those changes in anytime I want. So I can work safely over here until it works exactly as I want. And then, and only then, would I actually add it to the main timeline and literally merge it into main. You will hit merge conflicts. There's no way around this. Everybody eventually does. Don't feel bad. Don't listen to Zoidberg. You should not feel bad about merge conflicts. Merge conflicts are literally the evidence that Git is the stupid content tracker. It hits points where it's like, I don't know what to do, so I give up. Don't panic. If you do run into something that says merge conflict, run a Git status first, and it will show these, I couldn't, 
I could not commit these things. I couldn't add these to staging. These are the files that I couldn't do anything with. Then go look in those files and do a control F and look for this. Look for head or the branch name that you're trying to merge in. Because Git says, all right, here's where I am right now and here's what you want to merge in and I don't know what to do. All you have to do is edit this back to the state you want it to be in, do a git add, do a git commit, and you're back to good. Don't panic with commits. They're frustrating. They're very frustrating, especially if you're working with a lot of files, but they're not terrifying. They shouldn't cause panic. Uh, there are a bunch of tools that will help you with merge conflicts as well, but I highly recommend when you first want to encounter them, actually dig into it a little bit. Once you understand what it gets doing, the merge conflict tools, are make a lot more sense and are a lot easier to use. So after we do our work, well, if it's on our local machine and we're never going to share it, then we don't need to worry about this part, but most code gets shared out to a pipeline or even just among your peers to spread that code around. This is where your remote commands, and that, there's a bunch of commands for pushing and pulling from servers, but these are the three that you're going to encounter the most, I think, at least in the beginning. Git fetch, just go grab the changes that were made out on the service that your remote is connected to and pull those locally. Don't do anything with them, just bring them down and let me look at them. There's git pull, which does a fetch and then automatically merges. It just saves a step in case you just assume that everything you're gonna fetch is gonna be good and you're gonna wanna update it. This is the most common command. You're pulling down from the server and just merging those changes in and hope for no merge conflicts. Git push, well, from the state, your state of being, you're pushing those changes out toward the remote. So that's what Git push does. It pushes those changes. Now, actually how you identify what the um, remote name is and what branch you're pushing, those are implementation details that I'm not gonna get into today because you're gonna look those up anyway when you run these things. And I highly recommend that. There's, again, I'll point to references at the end that will walk you through that level of detail. All these hosting services, um, Bitbucket and GitHub and whatnot, they give you this special way to have a conversation with the owner of the repo to ask them to merge your changes. On GitHub, it's called a pull request, and that's, that's the common parlance. GitLab calls it a merge request, but it's the same thing. You make a pull request to say, hey, I wanna modify your project. Here's the changes. Take a look at them, ask me any questions. <clears throat> and if you like them, make them part of the project. It also gives us a way to have issue queues in a central location so we can have conversations about the project overall, a bunch of community tools. I'm not going to get into the finer details of what that means. The CICD tools for DevOps, this has evolved a lot in the last like five, six years. And they do a lot of other things as well. But I'm not here to talk about those in detail. Each one has its own pl pluses and minuses. I can't say one's better than the other in any given thing. Go check them out um, and find which one that works best for your project. So let's talk briefly about what goes in Git and what shouldn't go in Git. Git's awesome at storing code. That's what it was original designed for. But it's also good at anything that you can write into a text file. Literally anything. Anything that you need to version. I know people that have written entire books using Markdown and Git. Uh, Markdown's another thing I think everybody should learn. Um, documentation for a project get makes it very easy to version control that and see well what what the past is for that. Anything again you can put into a text file. You probably should be versioning with Git. There's some things you probably shouldn't put in Git. Um, they're security wise. Don't put passwords in Git. Assume that your code will be eventually seen by other people than you intend. As long as you keep that in mind, I love open source because that's the literally the in the forethought. I'm going to share this code. But don't put passwords, API keys. In 2020, 2 million secrets were detected on GitHub. Over 2 million uh, secrets were detected on GitHub alone. Don't hard code them. Don't put customer personal identifying information in, in there. Again, assume people you don't know that shouldn't be seeing this file is eventually going to see this file. Nothing wrong with them seeing your JavaScript functions or your Twig file, but don't put customer data directly in there. Anything, or any other sensitive data, any internal company memos, anything you don't want 
to be accidentally seen by someone. Just assume that eventually it will be. You can back up big things like databases with Git. I wouldn't recommend it. The bigger the thing you put in Git, the slower it gets over time. And databases have a lot of changes uh, that happen, and there's other ways to back up things like databases. And very large files, movie files, images, anything that's a binary at its core, which means it doesn't change in a granular manner, it changes, like, you change a picture even a little bit, it's a whole new file, it's a whole new checksum. Um, Git's not great at that over time. It, again, it can do it. You can store anything in Git, but eventually it's going to slow you down. There's a tool called Git LFS. All of the hosting services provide it. It's a way to a large file storage. What it is, you can take those media files and put them in a special server and then only reference them. And it goes from like your entire picture down to a three line text file that just points to where that file lives and then git automatically will pull the right files for you when you do a git pull when you're using git on the command line you're probably going to run into all of these things i covered a good chunk of them but things like revert and reset and diff i didn't talk about today but you will encounter them along your web path and this is where some people start getting nervous i've taught git to a lot of people some people really don't want to use the command line all day. I like the command line, but I also use a GUI myself. But here's the thing. Git is both the command line tool written for Linux users and a set of protocols that let us accomplish version control. Because of that fact, and it's so standardized, people have abstracted out Git and run it in C libraries or node libraries. This is how GitHub and GitLab and those players accomplish Git. They're not running the command line on their servers. They're running a version of like libgit2 that accomplishes Git. That's what Git Kraken does, for instance. So there are a bunch of GUIs out there. I'm not here to tell you one's better than the other, though I do have a favorite. Go find the one that's right for you. If you go to the Git uh, SEM website slash download slash GUIs, you will get to this page and it will explain a bunch of options to you that the Git project itself has vetted and said, well, these are, these are pretty good. So go find the one that's right for you. And I'm going to leave you today in the last five minutes with a practical example and give you some code because we're in an open source conference. I want to give you some open source code back. And this is something I would recommend if you are a, a marketer who hasn't coded, who's never actually made a commit. This is a great way to get started. This uh, example I'm about to show only requires content changes, doesn't actually require code changes, but it's also a way to expose the underlying code of Modic in a way that is pretty straightforward. And that's the only way to learn is to well, get your hands in there. So I made an email template and I recommend y'all try this at home. It was, it was kind of fun learning. You could build this from scratch, reading the docs, like it tells you what files you need, but Again, this is open source. People have already done the work for you. So I went and found the theme paprika, which I liked the layout of, and I forked it. Forking is a special term for those remote services that means make a copy of it into my account. So now I can work in MC Duane theme paprika variant, which is what I called it. I cloned it down to my local machine, brought the Git folder down with it, and I wanted to work safely in case I messed anything up or I didn't like the results, I wanted to start over and make it easy on myself. So I created a branch called Variant Work and went confidently about my business of making my changes. When I got to the changes to the point where, okay, I like what's going on here. I am ready to share this with the world. I added those changes to the staging area and then I committed them. Now, when I put it here, I took a shortcut and I added all the files and then I did a minus V to be verbose and tell me what I added. And then I made my commit message there. Could have done it with this with the GUI. You're not, you don't have to use the command line to do that. A GUI here, I could have just written my command message or commit message here and staged things from here. And this, I like this because it gives me a graph as well and shows me my history instead of having to run a Git log to look at it. But once I did my changes, made those commits, I went ahead and merged that variant work branch back into what 
normally would be called the main branch, but with Modic, the semantic versioning they use, there's a 4.x branch that was the main branch that I checked out. That was the first branch. Main just points back to uh, a set of commits. There's nothing special about the word main. Main is just a branch. So the one that was distributed, the one that default I downloaded and it was cloned into and opened into was 4.x. So that's the one I merged it back into. You can merge into any branch though. And finally, I pushed those changes up. And you can have this, this is yours. You can go get your hands on the Paprika variant uh, that I themed off of Japanese Breakfast, which is an awesome, awesome band you should all check out if you haven't listened to yet. Highly recommend and they're amazing live. But a little uh, tribute to them, go pull this down. And to use it, if you've never installed a theme from the uh, code before, you open your modic instance code base, throw it in the themes folder, and don't forget to clear the dang cache. I <laughs> struggled with uh, getting things updated until I realized, oh, I just clear the cache and then it works. But that's it. So find something you like in open source, fork it, clone it locally, change the code to make it do what you want to. I would recommend using a branch to do so. And then when you're ready to go, add, commit, merge it, and then share it with the world. Push it to your repo and, and tell people about it. You can read a lot more about Git out there. There's a ton of resources. I highly recommend reading the Git book. It's kind of long and it's really dense, but it's a good read. And it goes into great detail on how Git works at a fundamental level. We've written some stuff for you on the Git Kraken website. I recommend if you want to check out a GUI, check out ours. It's pretty good, if I do say so myself. Code Academy, Learn Git Branching. These are online courses where you can work with the command line safely in an emulator through the browser. And this last one is an awesome guide that breaks down very simply what, uh, what Git's doing. And there is one last resource I want to leave you with. Dang it, Git. If you ever get stuck, this is a bunch of very well-written short snippets of help to get unstuck. So there's scenarios people will typically get themselves in. Even concludes with like, there's nothing really wrong with, if you get really stuck, blowing out the repo and recloning it down. At the end of the day, it's just code. Don't get this stuff upset you. Don't let it get into your head. It's just one more thing to learn, but it opens up a whole world of possibilities with CI, CD, with sharing, with open source. So thank you very much. I've been Dwayne, and I am very happy to be here at Modic Conference, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Ooh. <laughs> thank you so much. Good stuff. Um, are you back online? Can we hear you? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep, yep. All well, fine. Okay. Um, awesome, awesome. I can't wait, wait to see the recording and uh, look at the, all the links that you provided. I think it's uh, something in it for everybody. Um, before we get that question, I'm sure there are others out there, there who would like to get the slides. Will you provide the slides? And uh, do you have a, a yeah, specific have, way to provide them? Um, well, uh, I could post them here in the chat or Q&A if that would work. Uh -huh. uh, so what, what would be better, the chat or the Q&A? Q oh, if you could just post them in the, in the chat here. And if you don't mind, I'll pick that up and make that uh, available for the future world as well. So we'll oh, sure. so we have the... Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I shared um, just there that repo. I had that actually of course. on my clipboard yeah. um, that I mentioned there at the end. Uh, but yeah, I will get the slides to you right now. Mm -hmm. Awesome. But I had them pulled up already. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So let's, let's get to um, Q&A. First is coming from Ruth. Here it is. What advice do you have to help us making make working with Git with Git less scary for folks who are not developers? Now I have to maybe maybe add something to it. 
we're not only talking about Git, but also GitHub. There are many things where GitHub is involved, for instance, issues, but also testing code, testing pull requests, and mm -hmm. uh, also even, even uh, bug fixing documentation and things like that. That's where we really come into Git. But, but if we first concentrate on Git alone, um, any advice for those folks? Yeah, the very first piece of advice would be to remember that uh, it works with text files, not just code. Uh, so every, it's very natural to assume that Git is a code-specific thing, that you have to go in knowing something about coding. And the answer is no, um, you, you don't. It, it's, you can just work with text files. Um, like I say, I've known a couple of people now that have written books in Git. So playing around just with text, uh, there's a few online tutorials and uh, online guides you can go through that literally don't touch code at all. They just work with text files. That would be the easiest way to safely dip your toe in the water. That's the practical example I provided there uh, with that theme. Um, I didn't make any actual code changes. I, I took out a little block of, of layout, but um, going in and playing with something that you do understand like a text file uh, and then multiple text files and then start building up from there slowly. That would be the first part of my advice. Um, if it's something trivial that it's just some notes you're taking, uh, I personally keep all of the notes I take from you know conferences I go to, internal meetings, pretty much everything I keep in just text files. And that's because I can version control them. I have a file called Get Cracking Notes. I have a file called Ambassador Notes. Uh, and I version control those in private repos, some of them just locally. Uh, but that lets me keep track of what I'm doing over time. I can look at my log at any point and see what I changed and the comments I made as I was changing it. And that's extremely powerful. Once that concept locks in, uh, you'll start looking for chances to use Git. It won't be a burden. It will be something I look forward to using this tool and I wish other tools could give me the same power. That'd be first advice. Uh, the second advice is uh, if you're not familiar with the command line, um, then start with a GUI. It, it, that There's nothing wrong with GUIs. Absolutely not. Uh, one of the reasons I like what we do at Gitkraken is we have both inside of our client a GUI that's completely drag and drop, just right mouse click, give you all the options. But we also have a terminal uh, panel or tab where you can get to the command line and use it that way if you want to. It's a lot easier once you have the concepts down of what a commit is, what an add is, what pull and push is, to then like start digging into the deeper things that you can do with Git. Most people use, it's that 80-20 rule. Uh, most people use the top 20% of what Git can do for 80 plus percent of what they do, but there's so much it can do. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third thing would be uh, find a project. And I know this sounds maybe a little out there, but find an open source project that you like. Um, could be Modic, could be Firefox, could be anything out there that has a repo. Um, and then go figure out how to contribute to it. Um, there's a path there. Almost all of them involve Git in some way or another, even if it's not a, um, a code level. Uh, as we heard in the, the session before mine, documentation is a huge deal right now. So even if it's not writing new documentation, even if it's going out and just adding the correct punc uh, punctuation or rephrasing things so it makes a little more sense to a non-developer, or someone that's new to the development, um, that will give you the exposure to start using these tools in a practical way, give you that quick hit that you're doing something actually helpful, but at the same time, teaching yourself a new skill. Uh, so yeah. that would be the three-prong approach I would take if I was brand new to Git or teaching someone Git for the first time. Yeah, well, certainly a ton of good advice. To me, it, it starts a little, little bit earlier even, and that is uh, who in our community sh is, is the audience yes, that, that we think should be able to use Git and should spend the, the, the hours and the, the brain cells 
the frustration in, in getting used to it and being able to stay on top of it, not only once a year. Um, and how can we shield the rest, uh, if, if any, uh, f from Git? I mean, those who, I mean, it's the same within an agency like, like we are. We always have those different profiles where we say, okay, this is the skill level that, that a certain per person should have and either is Git involved or not. And, and if Git is involved, then of course, um, doing this easy, painless, even fun quick start is, is the key. Uh, yeah. And yeah, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's actually an interesting uh, way to look at it as well. Because um, I, did I didn't address probably the biggest chunk of the modic audience in my talk. I talked about the end user developer and I talked about uh, the end user marketer. I talked about the developer. But in the middle uh, is the, um, the implementer, the uh, systems implementer. Uh, in the Drupal world, we call that the site builder. Yeah. Um, uh, but the people that are do have to live in the middle. I think an easy way to approach like learning Git there, um, everybody I've ever met that was a site builder has lists of things. Like here's my list of plugins I like, here is the steps I go through. If you've documented that anywhere, that is a prime candidate to start version controlling. Even if it's one file, even if it's just one like, folder of mm. here's the things I like, because then you can, with branching, have Modic set up but have modic setup branches for each of your clients, each of your setups, and then start modifying those or have a different repo for each of the setups. Even if it doesn't have any code in it, just a way to track, hey, here's what I changed. So if you want to go back and see what did this, what did I implement four generations ago, I can go do a git log, check out that branch or check out that commit that I did four commits ago and see, oh, this is exactly what it looked like for iterations ago and we remember mm -hmm. now we took that we took that out because it didn't really work and that's why we're not going to put it back in up here yeah you know what every once in a while some some disaster hits that could have been prevented if people had used git for a very simple thing and that is of course the best way to get them started and maybe even to get others started in the surrounding who observes the disaster and then there's a the motivation to to use this really simple thing in the end Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I have corrupted entire machines before. And mm -hmm. thanks to Git, I have been back up and running on a new install of Linux in under 10 minutes. Uh, I mean, aside from the install time of Linux. Mm -hmm. um, but that's only possible because I keep certain things like config setups and scripts that install tools for me in a, a private repo. So I install LastPass, I go to GitHub. I clone down that repo, I run that script, and literally it's under 10 minutes, I am right back to where I left off. I got all my Discord, all my bookmarks in, uh, in Firefox, everything's just back to where it was. Um, but quick note on backups. I did mention it there, like, it's not a great idea to think of Git as a backup system, but it does function as such. Uh, it, it's a case I mentioned there. Um, always like to remind people with backup systems, you got to always remember what uh, Jeff Gerling from the Drupal world introduced it to me, but the three, two, one strategy, you should have at least three copies of anything that's vital, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. completely different formats. And one of them should be completely off site. Git yep. gives you a way to kind of do that for part of it, but it's, it's part of the equation, not the whole thing. So you're one of the people who have their photo library in, in GitHub. Uh, <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no, no, no. The, the, the sad yeah. answer to that is yes, I do actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> for a couple uh, older things, but uh, no, I think mm. Google Photo does pretty good for yeah. for uh, most of my snapshots. Oh my god, oh uh, man, we're running out of time. I would have loved to ask you all the things beyond the, the topics you discussed today, because you, you mentioned rebasing, rebasing as an as important thing, or uh, all this terms like like squashing and, and uh, all those frightening things to the, to the newbies. Um, but instead, I'd like to follow up with, with one thing that you mentioned, and that is this paprika theme that you yeah. cloned as an example. And frankly, I never heard of Japanese breakfast, but I, I also noticed that you're into karaoke. So you maybe you want to bring this to us. Oh, well, one, I do not have. <laughs> uh, too uh, but but just looking through an example, it's um, 
it's one of the uh, things I always encourage people to do is go into all your projects with a little bit of levity, um, mm -hmm. looking for where you can have fun. If you read, I mentioned the Git book, it's full of jokes, not you know like stand up jokes or like laugh out loud funny jokes, but like it's full of, peppered with humor. Um, no so when I was looking through, like, okay, how can I make an example that's well, just contribute something and give people a jumping off point? Uh, I noticed, hey, there's one called Paprika. I kind of like the outlay. There's a song by Japanese Breakfast off of uh, their last album uh, called Paprika, and it's uh, the first song on the whole album. I was like, well, this is an obvious inroad, and if I can introduce people to a really cool band, I'm not affiliated with them in any way, shape or form. This is not a any way promotion. Um, just, I think there are a band people should check out. That's it's really good stuff. Okay. I'll check them out right now. Okay. Um, anything else? Let me just look at the chat as well, because last time we missed some questions. Uh, it says a comment about get pod. GitPod is a really interesting project. Uh, I have a whole other talk about um, uh, cloud development and moving on development under the cloud, but that's something else that Git has enabled that mm -hmm. wasn't even conceivably possible even just a handful of years ago that we could literally have entire development environments and work with code there and move it around. Um, but that's all built on the back of, of Git, the, built on this concept of a shared version control that's easily transportable. Um, but GitPod is a really awesome project. Uh, CodeSpace is another thing. Like GitHub itself, they went completely online. They All of their code that they produce in-house is made in code spaces. So nobody has a local development set up anymore. I think that's the direction we're going, but that's, again, a completely other talk. Yeah, uh, definitely. Okay, I am afraid we have to stop at this point, uh, unless there's new stuff. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for sharing the slides. If you in the audience have not uh, seen it, they are all in the chat room now, and we'll find a good way to make them public for the rest of us in the future. You'll find the recording as well. And um, right here in this channel, I think we take a break now and uh, see you later at this event. Dwayne, thank you very, very much. I'm very blown away and uh, I can't wait to discuss with my colleagues over here what, what they think. Thank you very Excellent. much. Well, Have a good day. Always happy to answer questions online. If, uh, if Feel free to reach out to me. Take care. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.